All right. It's uh, one minute after. I don't want to steal any of the time that our two speakers will uh, have today. So I'm going to get started. We um, are pleased to have you welcome you to the Beckman Institute Directors Seminar Series. This is the last seminar for the fall semester. Um, thank you for joining us today. We have two very special speakers. Uh, both of them are former Beckman postdoc fellows. Uh, Kevin Clark and, and Matthew Moore. Um, they will share the uh, our presentation. Um, I'm Jeff Moore, and I'm not related to Matt, <laughs> I, at least as far as I know. Um, we just happen to share the same last name. Um, and uh, I'm the director of the Beckman Institute. So again, thank you for joining us. We'll uh, take questions through the chat. So anytime during the talks, if you have a question, feel free to just um, uh, ask away and we'll get to them um, at the end. We'll start with Kevin Clark. Kevin is currently still on campus, although his three-year postdoc fellow at Beckman um, came to an end in August. He's working with Jonathan Swedler and Rainer Gillette he studies um, RNA modifications to better understand how those modifications contribute to learning and memory. He's going to give a talk today um, deciphering the function of RNA modifications to the central nervous system. So, Kevin, take it over. All right. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Jonathan Swedler's lab, um, but I'm going to be talking today about the work that I did at, as a Beckman fellow over the past three years. Um, I really focused on investigating a class of compounds, the pretty unusual compounds known as RNA modifications, and trying to understand what the function of these molecules are in the central nervous system. So a lot of us are probably familiar with RNA as a biopolymer that's comprised of four canonical nucleotides. Uh, adenosine, guanosine, cytidine, and uridine. But what might be a little bit less familiar is there's a collection of RNA modifications or modifications to the nucleobase or ribose moieties of RNA that range in complexity from, from simple methylations to multi-step enzymatic transformations that result in the appending of low molecular weight metabolites onto the nucleobase or ribose moieties of RNA. And uh, as of 2017, there have been approximately 30 classes of RNA modifications that have been identified, and that constitutes 160 unique ribonucleosides. Uh, so all these post-transcriptional modifications are similar in number to what we would find as post-translational modifications in proteins. Um, and the modifications to RNA and all of the RNA content in the cell uh, is referred to colloquially as the epitranscriptome. And so anybody who studies uh, RNA modifications will refer to this field as the field of epitranscriptomics. Um, so RNA modifications occur in all of the major subtypes of RNAs and all of the RNAs that we've investigated thus far. Um, I'm just going to focus in this talk in the th on three uh, main subclasses of RNAs. So messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA. Uh, these RNAs bear modifications and they have very different functions depending on their sequence context. So uh, a chemical modification that occurs in one part of an RNA uh, versus a different part will have a different function. Um, very recently, we discovered that there are enzymes known as writers that take canonical RNA sequences, recognize a specific sequence, and then deposit a modification uh, to result in perhaps a methylation or some other uh, exotic modification uh, of that RNA sequence. And intriguingly, there are also enzymes called erasers, so like demethylases perhaps, that remove these modifications and creating a really complicated cellular environment that is comprised of uh, modified and unmodified RNA sequences. And uh, this interplay between modification and, and unmodification uh, changes how these RNA sequences are resistant to degradation and, and also how they're translated. So they have really big influence on the cellular translation machinery. And I'm really interested in the central nervous system. And what we know is that there are some modifications that are preferentially enriched in brain tissue. And there are other modifications that are really critical for the expression of functional proteins uh, that help the central nervous system uh, perform normal function. And so despite this perceived abundance and the importance of these modifications, it's really quite difficult to directly measure RNA modifications because our standard, our gold standard techniques like reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction that we would often use to quantify RNA uh, often don't work with RNA modifications. We can't directly detect 
a modification that appears in, let's say, this prototypical sequence. Um, there's a, a, a coverage drop that would occur, um, and there's no direct detection of a methylated or otherwise modified uh, nucleobase. And another challenge that the field of understanding uh, RNA modifications in the central nervous system faces is we often want to work with mammalian models, something more similar to, to us. Um, and mammalian models tend to have billions and billions of neurons in the brain and make trillions of synaptic connections. And so this, this uh, creates a really complicated system for us to study the exact mechanisms by which RNA modifications affect CNS function. And another drawback to working with mammalian systems is they have really small neurons. So there's just a photograph of a neuron that's approximately 20 microns in dia diameter. That's a pretty large neuron. So the way that we get around this in the Sweetler lab is we work with an animal model called a plesia californica. Uh, this is a marine mollusk that has a relatively simple central nervous system comprised of several major ganglia that we can assign functions to. Um, and here's just a photograph of uh, one of the ganglia where you can see these brilliant orange neurons that can be quite large. And in the central nervous system of aplesia, there's between 10 and 20,000 neurons. Um, so this makes it numerically simple compared to a, a mammalian model, and thus allows us to assign specific functions to some of these more recognizable neurons. So a lot of these uh, can be quite large. This one here is probably about 500 microns in diameter. Um, and because of this, we can reproducibly identify a particular neuron in one preparation to the next uh, and figure out what pathways that neuron is involved in. And, and one of the behaviors that um, we've recently figured, we've uh, discovered all of the neural circuitry for is, is a very simple stereotype defensive reflex of this animal. So what I'm gonna show you uh, is, is a video that shows uh, a reflex where I'm gonna take a glass hook, tap this animal's tail, and you're gonna see this funnel-like appendage here on the dorsal side of the animal uh, be withdrawn. And this is known as the tail elicited siphon withdrawal reflex. So here you can see the tap, you can see the funnel-like appendage be withdrawn, and then it begins to protrude again. And this is a very simple defensive reflex uh, that the animal does uh, to um, uh, uh, be aware of any any threats in its environment. But if what we see is if we take a tactile stimulus and continue to apply that over and over to the animal's tail, here we're just looking at a, a dorsal view of Aplesia californica, um, and we can see its mantle organs here. And if, if we just apply a tactile stimulus over and over again, we see that these animals actually exhibit a form of learning known as habituation. So their response. So that, that time that the siphon is withdrawn beneath uh, the, the parapodia, we see that response time diminishes because the animal no longer recognizes that stimulus as a threat. Now, if we were to instead take the slug to the dungeon and start shocking its tail repetitively, and then come back in with a tactile stimulus, what we see is the opposite, where we, we see an enhancement of that reflex. So the, the siphon withdrawal reflex is, is much longer after it's experienced this noxious stimulus. And this is, a, this is a form of learning called sensitization, where the animal learns to generalize an aversive response to an otherwise innocuous stimuli. So these, these unassuming mollusks, these unassuming slugs actually uh, are capable of demonstrating some forms of learning. And over the years, um, we've uh, described a lot of the molecular mechanisms uh, that transpire upon shocking the animal's tail. So there's a neurotransmitter called serotonin that is released on pre- and postsynaptic neurons. And we see a secondary messenger cascade that results in protein synthesis and the, the expression of new genes. And I want to zoom in here under the protein synthesis step, because this is kind of where our understanding begins to break down a bit. We, we are aware of some proteins that are synthesized uh, as the animal is trying to create this, this new uh, memory of its experience. Uh, but really, it's, it's, it's difficult for us to understand uh, all of the proteins that are, that are synthesized during this process, during this learning paradigm, and how they're synthesized at the exact right time in the right subcellular location. And so that's where I think we need to return to our understanding of the flow of genetic information where we consider that there are modifications to DNA and modifications to proteins that contribute to the mechanisms of learning and memory. However, there's a big knowledge gap in how RNAs and their chemical modifications might influence these mechanisms. And so when I joined uh, Jonathan's lab to work on some RNA modifications at the beginning of my postdoctoral fellowship at the Beckman Institute, uh, what we wanted to do is first characterize all of the RNA modifications that we could possibly detect 
in the CNS of aplesia. So we took their major ganglia and we designed an extraction system uh, that allowed us to pull RNA from these neurons. So we have a photograph here of about 500 neurons. And there's a whole bunch of complicated solvents that we use here that I'm not going to get into details of. But ultimately, what we were able to do is pull out a, a total mixture of RNA. So I remember I mentioned those three subtypes of RNA at the beginning of the talk. In this sample tube, we have all of those different subtypes of RNA. So it's, it's a big uh, mixture of RNA biopolymers in a sample tube. And what we can do to detect the RNA modifications in that sample is we use enzymes to take those big, long RNA biopolymers and, and cleave them into constituent nucleosides. And so this creates a really complicated sample that's comprised of the canonical nucleosides in high abundance, and then our modified nucleosides in relative low abundance that we can then inject into a system known as liquid ch chromatography tandem mass spectrometry. Uh, in this experiment, what we do is we take our sample tube, we inject that complex mixture in the liquid chromatograph, which is this part of the instrument. We can separate all the constituents in that mixture, and then they elute consecutively into the, the, into the mass spectrometer, which then allows us to identify the, the constituent. So it, it allows us to identify uh, which modification it is, whether it's canonical nucleoside or a modified one. And then we can also perform quantitative analysis uh, from the data that are generated by the mass spectrometer. Uh, we published this in analytical chemistry, and then we used it to start profiling RNA modifications in aplesia. So what I'm showing you here are some raw data that we would obtain from the instrument. Uh, this is an overlay of extracted ion chromatograms. Um, each peak here represents a different modification that was detected in the central nervous system tissues uh, from aplesia. And on the y-axis is just an intensity, which is kind of a proxy for how much is there. Uh, we like to look at peak areas. So we typically integrate these peaks to get quantitative information about how much of a given modification might be present in the sample. Um, we can use gas phase fragmentation techniques. So these, these ions in the gas phase will be fragmented uh, to create kind of a, a puzzle that we can piece back together uh, molecule bit by molecule bit. And that allows us to then confidently identify particular modifications. You can see we have a bunch of uh, abbreviations for, for different modifications. For example, M6A would refer to methylation at the sixth position of adenosine. Um, MCM5 s to use a little bit more exotic one that I'll talk more about later. But what we were really interested in is now what happens when we take an animal and we, we train it with uh, behavioral methods and uh, we can determine, are, are there any modifications that change? So we can look at our data that we would generate here and see if peak areas increase or decrease for different modifications or if new modifications start uh, to appear um, upon behavioral training of this animal. So this is just an example of, a, of a, the life of a prototypical slug in our lab. Um, we would perform a pretest, which consists of measuring the siphon withdrawal reflex duration uh, with that glass hook tap. And then we perform trains. So every train I'm referring to here is uh, electrical shock of the animal's tail. Uh, after five trains, we give the animal a delay time. So either a half hour or 24 hours. And then we perform a post-test to try to determine if the animal has indeed exhibited sensitization uh, or a longer cycle withdrawal reflex time. And then once we've determined that the animal is sensitized, uh, we extract RNA from the major ganglia. Uh, first, let's look at the behavioral results. So after we shock the animal's tails, uh, we see that the 30 minute and 24 hour delay times don't really matter for uh, changing the cycle withdrawal reflex duration. It does, it does increase compared to our control group that did not experience the shock. So this is good indication that we are observing uh, sensitization in the animals that we've trained. So there's behavioral change. And then we zoom in to the animal's central nervous system. I want to focus on the pedal ganglia. So this, the, the, the neurons in these ganglia uh, innervate the foot and the tail of the animal. So right where we're applying the stimulus. Um, and what we see if we perform principal component analysis of a number of RNA modifications uh, in that tissue, is we see that there's a co-clustering of the naive animals and then the sensitized animals that have undergone sensitization, but given a 24 hour delay. However, if we were to look at RNA modification profiles at 30 minutes following sensitization, we do see a pretty substantial difference. So these these animals occupy a different region of the score plot in PCA, suggesting that their RNA modification statuses are very different uh, compared to these uh, the naive and then the sensitized group at 24 hour delay. So we're really intrigued by this. This is suggesting that there's some dynamic RNA modifications that are occurring as a function of behavioral status. And so we dig a little bit deeper to look at a specific sub subclass of RNA. So uh, we looked at transfer RNAs, which I'm just showing you a schematic in case 
uh, we need a refresher on transfer RNA and messenger RNA interaction. There's a component of transfer RNA that I really want to focus on here. This is called the anticodon. Uh, there's three nucleotides that interact with the codon of messenger RNA. So tRNAs are really important for decoding the message that is presented by messenger RNA. Uh, they will carry specific amino acids to the elongating polypeptide chain. And so we, we fractionated our total RNA that we obtained from the, the pedal ganglia of aplesia that have been trained and as well as some, some naive animals. And then we performed our LCMS experiments um, and hierarchical clustering analysis to look at how these modifications might be changing uh, in the sensitized and naive groups. And so what we can see here, the, the darker tiles represent a higher relative abundance of a particular modification. And on the rows, you can see the different behavioral statuses. So this is an unsupervised analysis. And we see that there's clustering of behavioral status uh, for the sensitized animals and the naive animals once again. And then on the vertical columns, we can see there are two modifications that I want to really focus on here. Um, M1A, this is a methylation of the one position of adenosine uh, that tends to have a lot higher abundance in the sensitized animals. And then MCM5S2U, this is a 5-methoxy carbonyl methyl 2-thiouridine. So it's a, it's a mouthful. It's a really, it's a hyper-modified uridine. And this is a really interesting modification because it is present, uh, is the only modification that is solely present at the, at the anticodon of transfer RNA. So it's the only one of this list that we detected that is directly interacting with messenger RNA. So we thought uh, these two modifications would be very interesting to follow up on. And we performed another behavioral training and RNA modification analysis in a new cohort of animals. And indeed we find that these two modifications are in higher abundance in sensitized animals compared to naive animals when we give those sensitized animals 30 minute delay uh, following their behavioral training. So what what, it, what does the MCM5 STU modification have to do with anything in learning and memory? So what we wanted to investigate is uh, tRNAs that contain this modification. And what we found is that there's a glutamine transfer RNA that in its anticodon has this hypermodified uridine. So it's directly interacting with, with codons that are for, uh, for glutamine. And it turns out that when you have a modified residue or modified nucleotide that is in the anticodon compared to an unmodified uridine, translation rates are quite different. So having a modified uh, uh, uridine at this position results in more rapid translation of a polyglutamine sequence. So if there's a polyglutamine mRNA sequence uh, and a modified transfer RNA, we see more rapid polyglutamine translation compared to unmodified uridines, which tend to slow translation down. And so this glutamine uh, seems to, this glutamine transfer RNA seems to have some importance for the rate of translation. We thought that perhaps there would be some proteins that contain lots of glutamine uh, that are present within the, uh, the CNS of aplesia. Um, so here I'm just showing, so, you know, fast and slow for the, the various modified and unmodified uridines. And if we look at the proteome of, a, of aplesia californica, we see that there is this really unusual protein, aplesia cytoplasmic polyadenylation element binding protein or APC PEB. At its end terminus, it contains a really glutamine rich tract that is approximately 75 out of the 150 initial amino acids at the end terminus of this protein. And it turns out APC PEB is really critical for the formation of long term memories. So we hypothesized that this polyglutamine stretch is gated by the availability of modified glutamine transfer RNAs. So if glutamine transfer RNAs are modified and available, this protein can be synthesized. And the way that we investigated this is we used Aplesia's approximately symmetrical central nervous system uh, to look at both a control and then a treatment group where we took a bunch of that MCM5 STU rich transfer RNA and we transfected it into the neurons in one half of the CNS. Um, and then after we waited for that 30 minute incubation time, uh, we performed an immunostaining experiment uh, with an antibody that recognizes polyglutamine stretches. And what we found is that there's an increase in the expression of polyglutamine proteins uh, in, the, the, in the treatment group compared to the control that did not receive the MCM5-S2U rich transfer RNAs. So this is all well and good, but one might also ask that uh, the question of, are these polyglutamine proteins even relevant? So there could be a whole bunch of different polyglutamine proteins that are synthesized here, none of which are functionally relevant in a learning and memory paradigm. And so to address this question, what we, what we did is we, uh, we targeted specific cells 
uh, called the pedal serotonergic cluster. So these are PS cells near the pedal pedal commissure of, of uh, plesia in the central nervous system. And we performed a technique known as electroporation on an individual PS cluster neuron. So we took an electroporation pipette, we filled it up with a solution that contains uh, MCM5 S2U rich transfer RNA. And we electroporated PS cluster neurons. And at, after our 30 minute incubation time, we then use another electrode to record the activity of this neuron or the excitability of this neuron. So our hypothesis here was if that transfer RNA is really uh, synthesizing some important proteins for the, that, that would change the excitability of these neurons and thus uh, be related to sensitization uh, in, in the animal, we should see differences in the excitability of neurons before and after electroporation. And that is indeed what we saw here. So before electroporation, what we're looking at are records that show spikes indicating uh, action potentials that are firing uh, after injecting depolarizing current into these neurons. And we see that uh, the transfer RNAs that have been treated with uh, tRNA that is rich in that modification, MCM5-S2U, uh, they tend to have more action potentials being fired during this stimulation duration. And because of this, we can say that there is an increase in the excitability of this neuron. Now compare that to a neuron that received transfer RNAs that is deficient in the MCM5-S2U, and we don't see any difference in the excitability. So now the big question is, are those polyglutamine proteins uh, important for this change in excitability. So uh, the experiment that we did is we took a protein synthesis in inhibitor. So this is anisomycin. We treated our cells with, uh, we treated the um, PS clusters with uh, anisomycin and we see that the effect of increased excitability is, is gone. So this indicates that the, the effect is protein synthesis dependent, which uh, suggests that those polyglutamine proteins that are being synthesized uh, through the introduction of MCM5 S2U rich transfer RNAs are really contributing to something important in uh, the animal CNS. And so this is just a summary that we do see increases in the, um, the firing rates for the PS cluster neurons when, when we treat uh, the cells with uh, MCM5 S2U rich tRNA. And just as to kind of summarize this part of the study, we found that neuronal RNA modifications are really important for increasing the synthesis of polyglutamine in neurons and also changing the excitability of those neurons. Ultimately, uh, we could correlate this back to behavioral changes in the animal. Now, all of these experiments that I'm mentioning here have been performed in, in bulk tissues apart from the, the uh, neuron firing experiments. Um, and what we're really interested in is... Um, we have, we have been profiling bulk tissues and getting ensemble averages of, of the RNA modifications that are present in that tissue. But in reality, uh, especially in the central nervous system, we know that tissues are comprised of heterogeneous cells. Uh, even of the same uh, histological cell type, we, we are aware that there are differences in, in individual chemical contents of these cells. And so we were really curious about some of these cells that might be on the extremes of that ensemble average. Uh, that could be where the unique chemistry is occurring. And so we wanted to develop a method that allows us to individually assay the RNA modification profiles of individual cells in those bulk tissues, which would then help us uh, really figure out, are there more than just you know, one or two modifications that, that, that might be important for uh, changes in uh, the animal's behavior? And so our previous efforts that I mentioned earlier on are only capable of detecting between eight and 10 modifications in hundreds of cells. And so uh, the method that we developed, uh, we called single neuron RNA modification analysis by mass spectrometry or Sinerma MS. And I'll just show you the workflow that, that we came up with. So we can take the major ganglia from aplesia and we can digest it um, and then isolate it using uh, a, a sharp glass capillary and then transfer that, that cell directly into a sample tube, uh, which we then uh, lyse mechanically. So we'll typically apply uh, pressure across the diameter of the cell. Uh, using one of those glass capillaries. Um, and then this allows RNA contents to be released into the sample tube, uh, which then uh, we can analyze using uh, LCMSMS. So uh, the, raw, the, the data that we would obtain look like this. And so we're not detecting as many RNA modifications as we did in our bulk tissue analysis, but we can see between 15 and 16 modifications here, which constitutes approximately half of the known RNA modifications present in a plesia CNS. So that's pretty good uh, for an individual neuron that we're investigating. And we're very confident in the identities of these different modifications uh, based on uh, our, our accurate mass uh, that we detect for these molecules and those gas phase fragmentation profiles that I mentioned a little bit earlier. So this technique, Sonerma MS, allows us to ask some questions 
about are individual neurons different from their surrounding tissue? So here's an example where we profiled an R2 neuron from the abdominal ganglia. So this is a cholinergic neuron involved in defensive mucus release. We isolated this cell and then compared its modification profile to that of the bulk ganglion in which it resides. And we find uh, using principal component analysis, again, for numerous RNA modifications, that these R2 neurons are in fact rather different from their, the ganglia in which they reside. Uh, we did a little bit more uh, uh, comparisons here. Um, and what I want you to focus on are these two modifications. So pseudouridine, and this is uh, pseudouridine, and this is 2 prime O methylguanosine. Um, in every abdominal ganglion, we see a higher relative abundance of uh, pseudouridine modification compared to the R2 neuron. Uh, similarly for the 2 prime O methylguanosine. So ultimately what we can say is yes, that, that these individual neurons do exhibit different profiles than their surrounding tissues. Uh, we can then ask the question uh, using a quantitative mode of Sonerma MS, which, which allows us to get exact amounts of particular modifications in cells, we can investigate functionally different neurons in the central nervous system of this animal. So we're going to be looking at uh, MCCs, which are metacerebral cells, which are serotonergic cells involved in feeding, and then R2 and LPL1, which I've I've mentioned R2 before, but LPL1 is a cholinergic cell also involved in mucus release. These are, these are two homologous neurons. And what we can do is, is take a look at absolute quantities of different modifications. So here's a methylation, here's pseudouridine, and we can see that metacerebral cells tend to have lower absolute amounts of these modifications compared to the, R, the R2 LPL1 cell pairs, which are functionally different neurons. Um, this is probably because you can see here, these cells are much smaller compared to R2 and LPL1. So we control for cell volume, uh, just we, we calculate the cell volume and then uh, we can calculate intracellular concentrations of these different modifications. And indeed, there are some modifications that are significantly different between these uh, functionally different cells. So overall, I just want to wrap a few things up today. I talked about how uh, RNA neuronal RNA modifications can influence protein synthesis in neurons and influence their excitability and ultimately behavioral change in, in this animal. Um, and then we further develop some uh, techniques that allow us to probe individual neurons. Uh, and we're excited to apply these methods for studying uh, uh, in more detail, the behavioral circuits in which uh, we, are, we are seeing some interesting changes in RNA modification statuses. So these are the people that I'd like to thank. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, please put uh, your questions in the chat if you have any. I'll, while you're doing that, I'll start and uh, ask. Um, first of all, I, um, looking back at your LCMS data, um, it looked like you were in pointing to a part of the LC trace that was essentially noise. Um, is that was, could you go back to that slide? Yeah, for sure. I'm just curious. I mean, how, how first of all, you chose um, to identify basically the needle in the haystack at that position. And uh, am, am I right? Like you're pointing to this period right below 30 minutes. That is that where is that where that particular yep. modification? So yeah, so yeah, exactly. No, that's a, that's a good thing to point out for sure. So um, with MCM5 S2U, it is a lower abundance modification compared to you know the canonical cytidine, guanosine, and even some of these other modifications. Um, so there, there's a big dynamic range of concentrations and abundances of these, these modifications and, uh, probably would have been better to zoom in here and show you the peak. <laughs> um, we have, we have that in, in, uh, published into, into our supporting information for the paper, but yeah, it is, it is much lower abundance compared to some of these other modifications that are, you know, so for example, M6A is present in all different subclasses of RNAs. So you'll find it in ribosomal RNA transfer RNAs and messenger RNAs, whereas this uh, hypermodified uridine can only be found in the transfer RNA fraction. And so therefore we see a much lower abundance for sure. Yep. Um, and if we were to remove all these other extract, we call these are extracted ion chromatograms, the different colors. If we removed all these other ones uh, and scaled our Y axis, you would be able to see a, a signal there, a nice uh, 
Maybe not perfectly Gaussian, but yes. I, <laughs> I totally be believe. <laughs> I just was amazed that you know you're um, you're digging into the noise and finding these really fascinating modifications. Sure, it's, sure. Yeah, I think uh, another main reason I wanted to highlight this one is because it, it ended up being quite important uh, in in our in our later studies and just kind of showing. I also thought it has a pretty interesting fragmentation profile when you when you look at some of the labile bonds here. Um, but yeah, I think showing showing the structure for this one I thought uh, was was important. While we're waiting, I'm, I have one more question, and um, sure. I'm I'm curious if anyone know uh, has looked at the mechanism of how this rate enhancement takes place when you've done this modification to the codon on the tRNA. Is there any so, yeah, understanding not, of what's right. what's going on at the molecular level, or why that modification is enhancing uh, the the rate of of protein synthesis? Yeah. So. Um, Unmodified transfer RNAs as they approach the ribosome take a lot longer to enter the accepting site. Um, and just because of that delay, messenger RNA is just paused, waiting for the right transfer RNA to come through and, and, and bring that amino acid. So uh, a really, it's really interesting that you, ha you, you have a pool of transfer RNAs in the cell some of which are modified, some of which are not. So, so there's a different stoichiometry depending what, what, what we hypothesize and what our data suggests. It depends on the cell's past experience. So if it's been activated many times, perhaps we're seeing, that's why we're seeing an increase in the modification at that particular position of the transfer RNA. Another one is that, that physical uh, decoding step. So the interaction between the, the transfer RNA's anticodon and the messenger RNA. So a modified uridine will stabilize that interaction, whereas an unmodified uridine is less, it, it has less uh, favorable energetics. And, and because of that, it, it results in, in potentially, you know, the transfer RNA comes in, doesn't find the right match, leaves. But then if a modified transfer RNA comes in, it finds uh, a favorable interaction and is then able to uh, deliver that glutamine into the elongating polypeptide. So yeah, the A site and the pe peptidyl transferase site uh, are critical ones there. But that's not to say that the the um, the leaving site, the E site, is also not important. There are different modifications uh, to other transfer RNAs that might also be important for for that that step. You you don't get a increase in the amount of uh, glutamine charged tRNA if it's modified or mo not modified. So in other words, you're just not upping the concentration of the charged tRNA. For, for, this, for this modification, that, appear, that, that does not appear to be the case. But for, um, there are other, there's um, a study out of Mark Helm's group that shows for uh, M uh, M5C uh, on aspartate transfer RNAs, the modification at the anticodon does increase the charging of that tRNA. So that, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really great point. There are some modifications that will result in enhanced charging. So, you know, with, with, without the amino acid to carry, then obviously, right, you don't get the elongating polypeptide. Yeah. But in, the, in this case, this is, this is because of the, the E site in the ribosome. All right. I should stop geeking out with chemistry questions. <laughs> and um, let's uh, thank Kevin one more time for the uh, great seminar. Really fascinating work and super exciting to really drill down and understand what are some of the molecular mechanisms behind uh, learning. And so thanks so much, Kevin. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Good luck finishing up. Next, um, Matthew Moore will give our, um, uh, our presentation. Um, Matthew is currently uh, associated Health Fellow at Palo Alto VA Medical Center in Palo Alto, California. Um, Matthew received his PhD in uh, psychology here at the University of Illinois. And in 2018, he was a Beckman Institute postdoctoral fellow. Uh, his research focuses on identifying and examining biomarkers to improve models of brain functioning aiming to contribute to the enhancement of well-being through conceptualization, prevention, and treatment. Today, he's going to talk about uh, multimodal methods of investigation, um, 
in uh, individual differences across spatial and temporal scales of human brains. So, Matthew, thank you for joining us from the West Coast. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, it's uh, I'm happy to be uh, speaking with you all and, and honored to be a part of the, the seminar today. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll get right into it. I'll be, be covering some of the research that we did during my time as a postdoc. I also did my PhD here, so uh, some of this extends even to, to things that we've been doing for, for quite some time um, with the DOCOS lab here at the Beckman Institute, as well as uh, a number of other collaborators that I'll, that I'll highlight. So uh, when we bring up the, or we think about the topic of, of cognitive neuroscience of individual differences, I'm, I'm talking more about a uh, systems level neuroscience compared to the the talk we just heard uh, in, in looking at the human brain and the kind of methods that we typically use to uh, look at the human brain uh, often are uh, MRI-based magnetic resonance imaging, both structural and functional, uh, electroencephalography. And uh, here at the Beckman Institute, we uh, also have a technique that was pioneered, uh, a fast optical imaging technique called event-related optical signal. This was pioneered by uh, doctors Gabriele Gratton and Monica Fabiani, uh, who were, were collaborators on some of the projects I'll highlight today. And uh, looking at this collection of, of methods that we can use in cognitive neuroscience is quite interesting because of the relative strengths and the complementarity across these measures uh, when we look at them in terms of spatial and temporal dimensions. So in the case of fMRI, uh, this is very good at telling us where things are changing in the brain. We can have uh, spatial resolution on the order of millimeters, but the uh, signal that it's capturing, this, uh, which is dependent on changes in the, the blood oxygenation levels, uh, we typically see changes in those on the, the order of seconds. So in relation to the kind of cognitive processes we might be interested in, this is a relatively slow signal. Um, on the other hand, when we look at EEG and uh, event-related potentials, we can have a much uh, faster temporal resolution. We can look at brain activity on the order of milliseconds, but the uh, recording of, of this is from uh, electrode sensors on the uh, scalp of the head. So we're really getting a summation of activity and therefore the, the sources of those signals is uh, blurry and, and our spatial resolution is not going to be as good as what we typically get with our fMRI approach. So these have uh, interesting uh, complements in, in these spatial and temporal domains between the two, but uh, the very in exciting possibility of work at the Beckman Institute is that using this fast optical imaging approach, we can also have a bridging technique between these two, because with this uh, Eros uh, approach, we can have a temporal resolution that is similar to our, our EEG, but a uh, highly localized measure that is very similar in spatial resolution to our fMRI uh, signal. So what I'll be highlighting today will be uh, the various projects we've done in a multimodal approach to combine and capitalize on the strengths of each of these techniques. Notably, the, the optical, however, does not fully replace fMRI or EEG because it is uh, limited to the, the penetration that the light can make into the outer cortex. So really, we only get a few centimeters into the, the outer cortex of the human brain using this technique. So com combining them and using them together is really uh, where we can see the, the greatest advantage. Um, in the research that, that I do and that I've, I've done with the DOCOS lab and, and Beckman collaborators, I'm often looking at how we can use these different cognitive neuroscience methods to better understand individual differences and their related biomarkers. And so we can ca be capturing a lot of uh, variability across individuals in these brain measures, but also at other levels, such as in personality and uh, these kind of enduring traits and habits that people have, as well as the uh, different cognitive domains that we might be interested in, uh, 
uh, better understanding, whether it's cognitive control or emotion processing. And then ultimately, we're, we're often trying to understand these previous levels that I've mentioned in relation to some outwardly observable behavior or symptom. So that could be uh, performance on a task, or it could be symptoms of things like anxiety and depression. And uh, ultimately, my goal and the, the goal of much of the research that I, I'm, I'm highlighting is that we try and better understand these individual differences in their brain correlates so that we can better understand and promote well-being. So we can kind of see this as a uh, identification and, and uh, capitalizing on the various tools we have to characterize and understand the mechanisms that ultimately help us promote uh, improved well-being and, and betterment of, of people's lives. And so I'll just be highlighting a few different projects today uh, where we, we uh, did research in this uh, area. The first being a simultaneous fMRI ERP study where we looked at a um, emotional oddball task to look at emotion cognition interactions across different spatial and temporal scales. And then expanding on that bimodal approach to incorporate our optical uh, technique in what we've been calling trimodal brain imaging and recording all three methods simultaneously. And then I'll briefly go over a, a project where we use this kind of brain personality symptom uh, framework, but we focused on brain structure in a, a much larger data set. And uh, the kind of analysis that we, we can use once we've acquired such a data space to understand the relation across these different domains of individual differences. So to start with the, the fMRI ERP study, uh, we were interested in looking at the dynamics of brain activity and by using the, the strengths of fMRI to look at where things happen in the brain and the strength of uh, ERPs and being able to look at when things happen in the brain, we, we acquired these together and then used them in an enhanced analysis to relate each of these modalities to personality and, and behavior, as well as integrating the, the two psychophysiological methods together uh, to inform each other. The emotional oddball task that we used uh, is in this case, the uh, participants are seeing a series of images uh, shown one at a time on the screen. And the common category is these square images, uh, which were either scrambled pixels, which were meaningless, or they were pictures of people, places, or things, which served as a distractor category in this, this common uh, square images that they're going to see frequently. And the pictures of people, places, or things could be emotionally neutral or emotionally valenced. And we were particularly interested in negatively valenced emotional distractors. The uh, goal that participants were given is to look in this stream of pictures shown one at a time and detect when they see the target stimuli, which was uh, circles of different size and color. And when they see these targets, they respond with a button press when they see any of the square images, they were to respond with uh, a different button press. And a classic paradigm like this has been uh, examined in fMRI before, as well as in ERP. So we had clear expectations for what the spatial signatures should look like, as well as the temporal signatures. And so, as you can see in the, the top left here, the uh, blue dots there are showing the increased response in sensitivity to the uh, target stimuli, which we see in these dorsal systems in the brain, including the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is there circled in, in the ovals. Uh, so these are systems that are engaged more in executive function and, and cognitive control, task relevant uh, processing. And we see an opposing pattern in response to the emotional distractors in these ventral systems, which are more sensitive to bottom-up information and uh, are shown in the, these red dots. And in particular, we were interested in the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, which is also in the, the bottom part of those ovals. And 
we were particularly interested in this area because as you can see from the white shapes that are also shown there, there is subregional heterogeneity in this ventral system. Those white dots and, and uh, shapes represent areas that have also been shown to be involved in coping with emotional distraction. And so we have both of these, uh, uh, the initial impact of emotional distraction and the subsequent coping that seems to involve this ventral system and being able to tease apart the, the spatial specificity of this along with the temporal specificity is something that uh, is difficult if we only look at fMRI, although we have these initial indicators that there's uh, this subregional specificity exists. On the right side, we have our temporal signatures shown in uh, our ERPs. In response to target stimuli, we usually see a prominent P300 waveform shown in blue in the, the top right, uh, which is a positive going waveform around 300 milliseconds. And in response to our emotional distractors, we tend to see a late positive potential, which is a, a slightly later positive going waveform in uh, the shown in red there on the, the bottom right. And so we have clear expectations for what these uh, uh, temporal and spatial signatures should look like in our fMRI and our ERP data. And in our study, we did replicate this finding with our dorsal ventral sensitivity, dorsal regions showing greater response to the targets and ventral regions showing greater response to the emotional distractors. We also saw our expected P300 to the targets and our late positive potential to the emotional distractors. And you can see that I'm, I'm plotting negative up now for the ERPs, which is a, a convention for, for ERP literature. So we see our expected temporal and spatial signatures, but we were interested in looking at the individual differences related to these different brain signals. And so starting with the fMRI, we looked at personality related uh, traits, including emotion regulation in the form of cognitive reappraisal and found that uh, a number of these regions showed decreased response to emotional distractors across individuals who have uh, greater emotion regulation, uh, uh, use greater emotion regulation habitually. And uh, in contrast to that, we saw that individuals with lower levels of self-control or, or greater levels of self-control impulsiveness showed greater response in some of these regions to emotional distractors. And importantly, where we see an overlap in these included uh, the posterior part of the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, which is consistent with the idea that this more posterior part of the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex is involved in uh, this coping with emotional distraction. Uh, beyond linking these individual differences to the, the fMRI data, we were also interested in, in linking this to our behavioral data and found that individuals with greater sensitivity to fearful stimuli, which was what our negative distractor images were, uh, showed greater ratings or um, higher ratings for how negative the negative distractor stimuli were relative to neutral. And on at the ERP level, we also found that people with greater levels of emotional arousability uh, tended to have greater uh, amplitude of the late positive potential to negative distractors relative to the target condition. And so this is consistent with the literature that is, has found that the late positive potential um, is associated with processing of emotionally arousing stimuli and uh, that uh, we can capture this across uh, individuals. But we took this a step further by also taking that late positive potential uh, amplitude trial by trial and then using that to analyze our fMRI data to see if there was uh, variability in the fMRI data that tracks with the amplitude of the late positive potential uh, in response to negative distractors. And we found that indeed the, the late positive potential amplitude was associated with variability in the anterior part of the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, 
which is consistent with this uh, anterior posterior uh, spatial specificity that we see uh, implicated in the fMRI literature where the anterior part of the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex is uh, sensitive to the initial impact of emotionally arousing stimuli, while the more posterior part is also involved with more of these uh, coping with uh, distraction functions. And so we had uh, this interesting integration of these different levels of the uh, brain imaging data and personality, as well as uh, behavioral data, but we wanted to expand on the way in which we can understand the ERP data relative to the fMRI data by then incorporating our optical approach. So as I mentioned earlier, there are ways in which these three can be used to, to triangulate and the optical approach can often act as a bridge between the two because of its shared features with fMRI and, and EEG. And so to do this at, at the Beckman Institute, we developed and deployed a custom apparatus to record all three of these modalities at the same time. And then we uh, processed and analyzed a proof of concept data set, recording all three of these together and then integrated them, capitalizing on the fMRI uh, F spatial information and the timing information from our ERPs to inform the way that we analyze the, the EROS data. So expanding the brain imaging data to, to further look at variability across and within individuals. And so for recording our optical data, we targeted the lateral prefrontal cortex where we expect to see this spatial dissociation in uh, the fMRI and first used a a small patch system where we had a very localized array to record our optical data from. And eventually we uh, built a larger helmet where we can record from these frontal areas as well as more posterior areas while also recording from our EEG uh, sensors and put all of that into the fMRI scanner while uh, someone completes the something like the emotional oddball task. So I will share my screen, but I will keep my camera off. Maybe it's something with my, my internet on the side. Can you see it now? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, no problem. So, so we uh, recorded from the lateral prefrontal cortex using the uh, a localized op optical array and then moved to a helmet format of this. Uh, where we could record from uh, many more regions in, in the brain. And what we found in this trimodal approach is that we can acquire, uh, we can replicate our fMRI findings in the emotional oddball with this dorsal ventral dissociation, but we can also see a similar spatial dissociation in optical data uh, in the lateral prefrontal cortex. We can also see our expected ERPs but very interestingly, our uh, optical data, you can see in the, the time signatures that are shown there, we see these spatial dissociations emerging at the same time uh, or times that coincide with our ERP data. And so in the, the second brain image shown there for the optical in the top right, uh, we saw a peak in the dorsal system that coincides with the timing of the P300 that we see to targets in the ERP data. And in the, the third brain shown there, uh, we see an increased uh, a peak response in the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex that coincides with the timing of our late positive potential. So very interesting uh, triangulation that we um, are able to see in this type of paradigm uh, across these three different measures. But we took this a step further by then capitalizing on the uh, spatial information from the fMRI to, to tell us where to look in our optical data and using the temporal information from the latency of the ERP response trial by trial uh, to ad temporally adjust our EROS analysis. So aligning it based on the ERP peak and 
then using uh, that informed analysis to compare with the traditionally analyzed uh, Eros analysis. And we found that we could significantly enhance the uh, amplitude of the extracted Eros data over what we would see in a, a traditional analysis of the, of the optical imaging data. And so by using information from each of the modalities acquired um, simultaneously, we could see an improvement in the kind of analysis we could do, which wouldn't be possible if we only recorded these uh, separately. And so this really broadens the space that we can look at individual differences by being able to look at such a rich data set of uh, dynamic brain activity across these three different measures and the various ways that we can integrate those. And so just to briefly highlight where we can take this kind of approach, we had uh, a previously a project where we looked in a large data set at a brain personality symptom approach using uh, looking at brain structure in particular and using structural equation modeling where we were looking at many of the same kind of personality variables and many of the same prefrontal cortex regions. So looking at that posterior part of the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, as well as the dorsal prefrontal cortex and another area, the orbital frontal cortex, which uh, have all been associated with various aspects of, of control and cognitive control. And then our uh, some various personality dimensions, including our emotion regulation, uh, dimension of cognitive reappraisal, and a few others that have been shown to be associated with uh, resilience and, and cognitive control. And then our outcome measures, which we looked at subclinical symptoms of anxiety and depression, but then looking at ways of using latent variables and structural equation modeling to look at common factors at this brain level and at this personality level to better understand the relations across these three different levels of individual differences. And we found that we could extract a, a latent variable from the brain data, a latent variable at the personality level, and uh, while controlling for some demographics, we, we found that greater levels of the uh, uh, brain volume in this case were associated with higher levels of this trait resilience and higher levels of resilience in turn was associated with lower levels of anxiety symptoms. And we also found in a mediation analysis that there's an indirect effect of these brain regions on anxiety through trait resilience. And so uh, we can imagine ways in which uh, we can use a similar approach where the at the brain level, we can look at other indicators of uh, brain dynamics. So in uh, that could be our fMRI, that could be ERPs, EROS, uh, to look at the various dynamics of, of the brain, along with individual differences at levels like personality and outcome variables like symptoms or uh, behaviors. And so our, our space for where we can characterize and understand individual differences is uh, really much broader now that we have these kinds of tools available to us, particularly uh, the, the trimodal approach at the Beckman Institute. And so to just summarize, uh, in trying to understand individual differences and in relation with, with well-being, uh, there are many ways in which we can translate these tools and these approaches including uh, application to healthy and clinical populations, including the ways that we conceptualize and diagnose and the ways in which we use that information and the models that we uh, obtain by, by measuring brain and uh, individual differences at, at various levels to inform the way that we uh, design prevention and, and treatment programs. And so there's many different levels at which we can interface now, uh, particularly using these kinds of novel tools that, that are available. And uh, so I would just like to thank the uh, Dolcos lab, as well as uh, Monica and Gabrielli's lab and many of our collaborators here at the Beckman Institute. And thank you to all of you for, for listening. Thanks so much, Matthew. I really enjoyed the the presentation. Um, if uh, anyone has questions, we have time. It's 
a little after the top of the hour, but we'll take time for a question or two. And I, I'll, I'll start with, um, you know, uh, you, you described your next steps, but um, I didn't see on their next steps related to sort of uh, technology development. And I'm curious what you think would be some of the most uh, exciting directions to go, or what are the gaps that prevent you from, from getting there? Well, uh, one of the major hurdles that we uh, were able to accomplish during uh, my postdoc time was that we really had these very localized patches that we were recording from. So we really had to have targeted ideas uh, in terms of, of what we should look for and what we can record from. And we expanded that with this helmet that uh, we got to use uh, a bit in that proof of concept, but we really, as recently as this summer, we're recording data using that full helmet apparatus uh, to, to have more whole head coverage. And we can start to look at things that are more complicated, but more relevant uh, as time goes on in uh, neuroscience, looking at brain networks and the dynamics of these brain networks. And so being able to incorporate something where we have a much more whole brain approach, I think is where this kind of technique could really have some fascinating implications. And I think our helmet is a, a huge step towards that. We can um, potentially expand that helmet to have even uh, denser coverage. There's still you know, relatively limited areas where we have prefrontal areas and, and parietal areas, but uh, we could potentially expand to the temporal areas, occipital, and so on. There are some logistical challenges with expanding just because someone's having to wear all of that and, and lay in the scanner. But I think that the having broader coverage really opens up more possibilities for the kinds of analysis we can do and the kinds of questions that we can answer related to uh, dynamics in the brain. I, I'm not sure I totally understood um, how you make adjustments um, as your, do you, do you collect your uh, MRI data and then do you adjust in any way um, the helmet and the location of your, your sensors? Is that, is that how you do it? Uh, so with the, something like the patch system, that was much easier because we can simply move where the patch is going to be located during a scan. With the full helmet, we had to kind of commit to uh, a layout, but we we can potentially ad adapt, uh, particularly where the optical would go. So with our patch system or with uh, some modifications we could do to the helmet or creating another helmet, we can uh, change where we have our optical coverage mostly. Uh, we pretty much have everything settled for the EEG, we have a uh, whole head 32 channel recordings, which is a, a pretty reasonable uh, coverage for the, the whole head, given the, the amount of things that we have to attach to someone. And our, our fMRI is also, um, we've made some improvements that, uh, there as well. Over the summer, we, we changed our sequence to have a faster uh, TR so that we're, we can look at uh, uh, something like a second rather than several uh, seconds. And uh, the faster we get with that, or if we try and increase the resolution, we can potentially uh, really push the, the envelope in terms of the dynamics we try and pull out of each one. Uh, whereas we've been kind of playing to the strengths of, of each uh, so far. So, so based on the yeah. ability to get uh, more signal in shorter time, with higher spatial resolution, um, do you see this as being a, uh, an area where higher field MRI will, will help you? Or do you see that as, um, you know, not necessarily, there's trade-offs maybe that I'm not thinking about that maybe a higher field isn't going to be so helpful? So using a higher field would be really exciting. I, I think, especially with being able to localize and being able to, um, have more for information from, from our fMRI data, which would be really exciting. I 
Uh, my understanding is that there is some some challenges with making sure that we can safely do the EEG, but I, I understand it's been done. So I think that's, and uh, with the, the optical, that shouldn't be an issue. So I, th I think this could be a really exciting direction um, that could potentially, you know, Beckman's the place to do it. So that, that would be exciting to see. All right, we're running past the top of the hour. So I think what we should do at this point is, um, you know, I think uh, this is a great set of presentations that show uh, the neuroscience work going on at Beckman that cuts across the scales from the truly molecular level all the way up to uh, cognition and behavior and the uh, advances in technology as well that are related to advancing neuroscience. So thanks both to Kevin and, and Matthew. Um, we really appreciate the, the presentations that you gave this afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.